All right, guys, Break Hard Podcast back again for another week here. I spent my Friday and Saturday at the racetrack this week. Made the, made the trip up to IRP on Friday night for the ARCA race and the Truck Series race. Shout out to Daniel Dye, hooked us up with uh, some hot passes or VIP passes as they're referred to now when you go to pick them up and they have a little tag on them that gives you uh, access, grid access, and all the other fun things. So I did some exploring there. We'll get into that in a minute. Saturday, headed over to the big track in Indianapolis and checked out the IndyCar Grand Prix, the second one. What, Gallagher Grand Prix, is that what they're calling it? I'm not 100% sure, but it's the second one that happens. And then the Xfinity race that evening, which I didn't end up staying the whole time for because of the lightning and then the fact that I wanted to get home before midnight. So, oh, we also had the cup race on Sunday, completely forgot that. Did not say for that, obviously. Uh, came back after the Xfinity race. But we also had Michael McDowell locking himself into the playoffs. Uh, doesn't have to point his way in because he now has a victory. Something that's not, I don't think, anybody expected, to be completely honest. And we'll get into that in a minute as well. And then we'll also talk a little Alex Pillow contract saga at the end of this just to try to cap that off. I don't know if that will ever actually be capped off, but we'll get into it. So, we'll just start backwards going forwards. Sunday, Cup Series race at the Indianapolis Road Course. Likely the last one as the series is all but headed to the Oval next year uh, to return to the original Brickyard 400 on the 30th anniversary of that race next season. There's obviously a tire test uh, Monday and Tuesday of this week. Uh, they did some testing on Monday before the rain came. They'll be back on Tuesday. Uh, conditions should be a lot better, so they should hopefully get more running in. But Indianapolis did put out a renew your tickets, um, and they referred to it as the Brickyard. And the car in the background is heading counterclockwise down the straightaway, the way you would run the oval. And there's also a faint outline of the oval in the background as well. I guess it's not an oval, right? It's a rectangle, but we're just referring to it as the oval. So, I mean... The tire test is just a, a formality, but it seems like they will be headed back to the Oval next year, and I would assume that means Xfinity on Saturday, uh, like it was before the switch to the road course, and Cup on Sunday. There was talk about how they couldn't do, uh, you know, the switch, run the road course on Saturday, Oval on Sunday, which they definitely did in the past. So, uh, albeit only for one year, and I'm sure it's a pain in the ass, but at the same time, like, it is possible if you wanted to keep that Xfinity IndyCar doubleheader going, obviously you could just not have any on-track activity for the Cup Series that day, and it would be a really compact schedule for everybody uh, in the Xfinity Series and the IndyCar Series garages, but it is possible. Anyways, back to what happened on Sunday on the road course. Michael McDowell picks up his second career victory, and what is that, the fourth win ever for Front Row Motorsports? You had uh, David Reagan's win at Talladega, Chris Buescher's win at Pocono, uh, Michael McDowell's Daytona 500 win, and now this win on the Indy Road Course. Uh, I mean, he laid it on him. Michael McDowell in Front Row Motorsports, on speed, on merit, went head-to-head -head with Hendrick Motorsports and Chase Elliott and beat them straight up on Sunday. Something that you likely never see, especially on a track that's not a drafting track. Like, Michael McDowell, for years, we hear about how he's such a good road course racer. Michael McDowell's great on road courses. This and that, and he doesn't have a win to show for it in the Cup Series, at least. Obviously, he does have a win in the Xfinity Series on a road course with RCR. But, man, all we hear about is how good he was. And I'll say this. During the Gen 7 era from last year to this year so far, he does have an average finish of 9.1 on road courses and now has a win uh, in that as well, which is awesome for him. I mean, that's... A heck of an accomplishment and to do it with that team as well with a first year crew chief and to go out there and qualify uh and set what he qualified second i believe or third let me pull up racing reference here and i'll let you know he qualified fourth my bad tyler reddick qualified second and daniel suarez was on the pole Qualifies fourth, ends up winning the race, leading 54 out of uh, 82 laps. Obviously, there were multiple different strategies in there because at one point you had Danny, or Christopher Bell leading 11 laps, uh, and then you had Daniel Suarez that led six, obviously, a little bit earlier. You also had Denny Hamlin leading eight laps as well as they were all on a bit of different strategies there for a little while. But McDowell, 
he was, you know, on the border of trying to point his way in. He locks himself in now. He takes another playoff spot and puts Bubba Wallace on the bubble. So Bubba Wallace is now 28 points to the good as we head into the last two races of the playoff or the regular season before we get to the playoffs. Bubba's going to have to survive Watkins Glen, and then he needs a good run at Daytona. But everything can change if we go to Watkins Glen next weekend and Chase Elliott ends up winning the race. That now knocks Bubba out. He's in a must-win scenario heading into Daytona. Knows he needs to be in the playoffs. Knows that car's capable of being in the playoffs. And, you know, it's it's going to be tough if, if Chase Elliott does win. Or anybody else out, that's outside the points wins. Uh, right now. Anybody that's outside of the playoffs wins, he's out. So he needs to be ultra-aggressive these next two weeks, uh, especially at Watkins Glen, especially if Chase Elliott is in contention. He needs to try to get as many points as he possibly can. And then Daytona, obviously we know he's good at Daytona and Talladega, so it's not something you really have to worry about. But it is something that he needs to keep on his radar because there's no chance of him being able to catch Brad Keselowski, who's ahead of him in points, by roughly a hundred and... 15 points or so. So, yeah, it, it, it'll be difficult for him. But for Michael McDowell, he locks himself into the playoffs. Front row motorsports got a car in the uh, top 16. They will be racing for a championship. Will they be able to survive and make it out of that first round? I don't know. Maybe, right? Like, there's crazier things that have happened. And especially with that first round, having some tracks that, you know, we saw Eric Jones win at Darlington. Um, I also believe... Now I got to look at the schedule real quick here. Uh, yeah, you have Darlington, you have Kansas. That's n not going to be one of their better tracks, more than likely. But at the same time, like, it, it could be. Who knows at this point? And then you finish off that round at Bristol. And that's another place where you could make things happen. And Ford has certainly found something now, right? Three wins in a row for Ford. Uh, two for Chris Buescher. One for Front Row Motorsports. They've figured, Ford's figured something out. Stuart House Racing hasn't, but Ford certainly uh, has. And if they can continue that and carry that into the playoffs a little bit, uh, things could be wild. So Michael McDowell walks himself in. It was nice to see him be able to celebrate with his family. They weren't there for the Daytona 500 win uh, in 2021 which is obviously a bummer uh, because that's a huge win. But the fact that all of his kids were there for for this win and his wife, and they all got to kiss the bricks together, super nice. Obviously, like, we all clown on Mike McDowell sometimes. Darrell Waltrip calls him a good Christian boy all the time. You know, all the little things. But the man put in one of the, the better drives you'll ever see on a road course. Like, just dominated him. And I saw a bunch of people being, like, specifically Chase Elliott fans, being like, oh, man, if... If Chase got around the lap cars quicker, or if he didn't get bumped out of the way by Suarez, he wins that race. He doesn't win that race. Because if you were looking at his, at McDowell's lap times, he was basically just toying with Chase. He was riding. I mean, over the last seven laps of the race, Mike McDowell basically ran an average lap time of 91.0 seconds or so. Basically 91 flat. Uh, Chase Elliott was trying really hard. He was running... Somewhere around an average lap time, if I'm just going to calculate this off the top of my head here, somewhere around a 90.8-ish. Uh, and anytime Michael McDowell needed to try to step it up a little bit, he would just match him. He wasn't pushing it at the end there, and he even said that in his post-race press conference. He was like, oh, I was just conserving, knowing that there's always that possibility for a late race restart to come out, or a late race caution that would set up a late race restart. And yeah, he basically just road for the second half of that or not the second half but the last 20 laps of that race or so he put in some fast lap times but he didn't have one of the top five fastest laps um after lap 63 so basically for the next 20 laps he just rode around meanwhile chase had one two three four five six seven laps in that period uh, where he had one of the top five fastest laps and just still couldn't catch him but every time chase would respond with you know a fast lap Michael would come back the next lap and he would just be about a tenth slower or he would come back and be, you know, three or four tenths better. Nothing crazy, but enough to to just keep that gap going again. So, yeah, Chase put in a great drive, had a really good car early. Um, 
Still finishes less than a second behind, but overall incredibly good. Also, word of the wise, if you are a person that wants to look at data during the race, this website called NASCAR Domus, I'll put a screenshot of it up, uh, absolutely fantastic. Shout out to whoever made that. I don't know if they have like a Patreon or a Venmo, but I would send you a couple bucks for just putting this together. It also uh, has the scanner built into it as well, so you can listen to whatever driver you want to, and it gives you last 5, 10, 15, 20 lap averages, the number of fastest laps a driver has, most positions gained since the restart, most positions gained since the start, gain or loss since the start. Um, yeah, it's uh, fantastic, and it gives you the lap times for every driver for literally every lap. And then it highlights the ones in green, which are the fastest. And if you look at A.J. Allmendinger's during the race, A.J. Allmendinger needs, he needs some confidence instilled in him again. But he's been absolutely, he was absolutely lights out. Obviously, he had that run in with Blaney, and then he did a little bit of an off-road excursion. But for the from lap 34 to lap 47, all but two of those laps, he had the fastest lap time going. He had 21 fastest laps on Sunday. Uh, the next closest driver was Daniel Suarez with 10. So AJ Allmendinger was absolutely flying. He obviously, I think there's a couple things going on. I don't think AJ's super psyched on being in the Cup Series. I think it's a struggle. He went from winning in the Xfinity Series last year. He's also having a kid. I've never had a kid. I don't necessarily want one. But I can imagine that that's probably a lot of pressure. And as you're just anticipating this kid coming, and it's been the last two weeks now, three weeks maybe, I don't really know how that works. And he's just kind of been expecting it, and it still hasn't happened yet. I think it's probably weighing on him a little bit. Again, this is me just thinking out loud. He could just be like, no, dude, I just suck right now. And maybe that is what it is. But he was absolutely flying in this race. It's unfortunate that he had that run in with um, with Blaney that ended up spinning him out and then unfortunate that he went off-road as well. But I did also see one of the Motorsport Analytics accounts, and I can't remember who it was off the top of my head, and I apologize, but basically they put out a graphic and they do this every week and... I'm going to have to try to find it real quick just because I want to give them an actual shout out. I'm trying to find it by looking at somebody else's account. Okay, I'm not finding it. I know I didn't get I didn't put a lot of time. Oh no, Auto Racing Analytics. Those guys put out a graphic each week basically of like, you know, if there weren't any cautions, you know, where would they have finished that based off of median lap time? And based off of the median lap time, Daniel Suarez would have won the race if there was not a caution um, for the entire race. Yeah, if the entire 82 laps of the Indianapolis race were based on median lap speed data alone, this is roughly where the top 10 cars would have finished on track. Daniel Suarez is your winner. Mike McDowell in second. And AJ Allmendinger would have finished third. So he had plenty of speed. It's just unfortunate that he ran into some issues there early. Hopefully, uh, though, he can kind of get things going again because... It's a bummer to see AJ not be up there contending. You also had Joey Logano. Apparently, when you go to the Indianapolis road course, Joey Logano loses his mind. He was absolutely insane. And last year, obviously, the first year, he ends up in the tire barriers. Last year, he decides to go seven wide and force his way into turn one like an absolute idiot and then get out and criticize everybody else for doing it. And then this year, he just first hip checks Justin Haley off into the barriers, puts him into the tires and basically ruins his day. And then on the restart, he goes into turn one and just decides to use the 12 as his break. And he he clobbered the back of Ryan Blaney. And it's like, dude, what are you doing, man? It, it makes no sense when he goes there. He just completely blanks out. Only one caution on Sunday. And that was a big talking point because a lot of fans were like, oh, this is a boring race. This is a very natural road course race. And I personally didn't have a problem with it. I know there are certainly people that are, you know, not the biggest fans of it, but I, I like to see, see things play out naturally. The fastest cars ended up winning. Tra or passing was incredibly hard. Track position was crucial all day. Eight of the cars that finished in the top 10 started in the top 10. So yeah, there's some things there that aren't the best I saw somebody be like, oh, an F1 race broke out. And I'm not going to... Everybody's open to their own opinion. I'm not going to disagree with that at all. But at the same time, there are certainly, you know, some things that I'm fine with 
it not embarrass not the sport not embarrassing itself when there were a ton of eyes on the race this weekend just from an international standpoint is probably for the best. Obviously, you had a lot of Japan tuning in because Kamui Kobayashi was in. You have Australia and New Zealand paying attention because Shane Van Gisbergen and Brody Kostecki were here. Some F1 fans tuning in to see what Jensen Button uh, could do. You have, you know, sports car fans trying to see what Mike Rockefeller uh, is doing. So you had a lot of people tuning in. You had the, all the Polish fans watching Brad Kozlowski, uh, Mexican fans watching Daniel Suarez. So yeah, you got a lot of parts of the world and some people trying to pay attention to what's happening. And to see them not embarrass themselves was certainly a win, uh, in my opinion. I know some people want to see the carnage and everything, but a, a nice, respectable race uh, is not a bad thing. Shane Van Gisbergen comes home 10th in his second NASCAR Cup Series race, and I saw a lot of fans like sort of dancing about him not winning, which is weird because, like, yeah... I get it from like a if you're a, like a diehard NASCAR fan, you don't want to see your drivers come or get embarrassed like they did at Chicago. Okay, I can maybe get behind that a little bit, but at the same time, can't you just appreciate a good race car driver? And I really think that's like the camp that most people should fall into. But yeah, celebrating that he only finished tenth is kind of funny because like he still has more top ten finishes this year than Ryan Priest, and he has the same amount of top ten finishes. Eric Almarola and Harrison Burton. So in two races, he's still better than some guys in pretty well-funded rides and big rides. So at the same time, I mean, yeah, celebrate him only finishing 10th. It's still massively impressive in only his second race on a track that he's never been to that these Cup guys have been to for the two years prior. So yeah, good for him. Good solid finish uh, and run. He did get into Ty Gibbs, just absolutely wrecked Ty, spun Ty Gibbs out, which I don't think you're going to hear anybody complain about other than that guy that thinks that he's part of Ty Gibbs' team and wears the merch and the hat and everything and gets hot passes and tells everybody that he's part of the team. If you know, you know. But, uh, yeah, there wasn't anybody being like, oh, man, that was dirty what he did to Ty. Ty wasn't happy about it. kind of looked like he flipped him off after the race, but it's hard to tell. He could have just been putting down his window net. Either way, SVG did come over the radio and say somebody's – not happy behind me, but I can't tell who it is. I think it was Ty Gibbs. Um, outside of that, you also have Brody Kostecki having to start last uh, or, you know, 38th or so, having to go to a backup car after wrecking and qualifying, put up the seventh fastest time in Group B qualifying, would have started, what, around like 14th or 16th, or, or not 16th. Actually, he may have actually put in the sixth fastest time yeah he was supposed to start 11th uh so that's what that would have been uh unfortunate that he had to go to the back because he ended up driving all the way back up to 22nd finished on the lead lap which is awesome for him last car on the lead lap but if he would have been able to at least start in 11th i think we could have seen um a pretty good race out of him maybe a top 10 uh, if not a top 15 for sure so bummer that that didn't get to happen, but hopefully he gets to come back over and do some more. It seemed like he had a fun time. Uh, he was had nothing but good things to say about it as well. Of the other international drivers, you had Mike Rockefeller finishing 24th in that 42 car, replacing Noah Gragson. Uh, you also had Jensen Button finishing 28th in his last start this season in that 15 car for Rick Ware Racing. And then you had Kamui Kobayashi finishing in 33rd place. He had a bit of an, ex an excursion day. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. was just going all Team America and taking out any foreign driver that was around. Uh, 1776, we are the champs, absolutely delivered a hammer to Jensen Button and took him out. Then decides to wreck Kamui Kobayashi. And, you know, some people might just call that patriotism. I'm not sure. But, yeah, he went all Kenny Powers there. And wanted everybody to know that he was willing to take out the foreigners for whatever reason on Sunday. Just a weird coincidence that that kept happening. But overall, I give the race a, what, like a, a, 70, a 78, 79, somewhere in that range. It's a high C, right? Uh, like to see more passing up front. It felt like the 34, the 9, and the 99 were all so evenly matched. It didn't really feel like they could actually pass each other. 
And then you have having eight of the top ten cars finish, eight of the uh, top ten started in the top ten. That's difficult just because you want to see some people, so the comers and goers, right? You want to see guys making passes and doing all the things, and that's not really happening or didn't happen rather. So yeah, I think we just like to see passing be a little bit better, but we know with this Gen 7 car, passing on road courses is at a premium. Now, it's a lot harder. You've got a bigger tire, you've got better brakes, you've got better handling cars. It races more like a sports car race at this point. So yeah, this I don't want to call this a future going forward because we're still going to have a absolute batshit crazy um, road course race at some time, but moving the restart zone to uh, right before the final corner onto the front stretch certainly helped. Obviously, Logano still tried to send it. But, yeah, overall, 79 C+. Plus, uh, could be better, could be worse. Uh, perfectly acceptable uh, with a with a new winner, right? A guy that we don't typically see in victory lane. So I, I will never complain about that, especially a guy that went out there and laid it on him like he did on Sunday. So... Let's move on to the Xfinity IndyCar doubleheader real quick. All right, the Xfinity race on Saturday at the Indianapolis Road Course. Obviously, it got started at the lovely time of 5.50 in the evening, uh, well after the IndyCar race. Actually, not well after the IndyCar race ended, but well into the afternoon uh, there. And if you've been at the racetrack since basically 9.30 in the morning, 10 o'clock, it was a long day. So that was the boat that I was in. So the Xfinity race gets started and it very quickly starts raining and the caution comes out and then we're under seven laps. We got the first seven laps in before the caution came out and it rains, then it lightnings. And at that point we were like, uh, I don't know if we want to be here for this whole thing. Shout out to the yellow shirts that were complete assholes in typical yellow shirt fashion as we're trying to run to the tunnel they're yelling at us to follow the crosswalks. There's no cars around. Obviously, I'm an adult. I look both ways before I run across an intersection, especially an intersection on the infield of a racetrack where cars are coming in and out of the tunnel. I'm aware. Uh, as the PA is like, please get to, you know, shelter or whatever they were saying, this old man took it upon himself to yell at us for trying to get under cover versus being out in the open like his dumbass was. So, never change yellow shirts. Uh, the day that a yellow shirt is actually nice and helpful, I'll know that things are doomed from that point on. But, having said that, <laughs> we did not wait out the entire lightning delay. At that point, it was well, what, close to 6.30 or so, and it's like, okay, we got to... We got to get out of here. It was, six, it was more like 620 because I think they finally called them back to their cars at like 625, but didn't get, get back going until almost 7 o'clock. And at that point, I still have an almost two-hour drive um, to get back home, and it's not worth sitting around all night to drive back in well into the evening after I've already been gone forever. So, not that that matters. Anyway, the race gets restarted, and Ty Gibbs takes over the lead. I mean, not immediately, but he did essentially take over the lead again, uh, or he took over the lead before that. And then through pit cycles and everything like that, he ends up uh, finally reclaiming the lead on lap 46 after all of the stages and, you know, pitting and everything like that gets over. And he ends up winning the race over Sam Mayer. AJ Allmendinger faded there. Uh, late, unfortunately, he comes home third. Austin Hill fourth. Justin Allgaier fifth. You have Cole Custer sixth. Parker Kligerman seventh. Sheldon Creed eighth. Kaz Grawla ninth. And Brett Moffat rounds out your top ten. Sam Mayer apparently has now become a road course guy after winning his first race in the Xfinity Series at Road America. But yeah, I mean, only two car or only three cautions: one for rain, one for a car stopped on track, and one for another car stopped on track. So. Yeah, overall, an uneventful Xfinity race as well for the most part. Like, very straightforward. Uh, obviously, you got some rain. Here's one thing that will continue to annoy the hell out of me when it comes to NASCAR racing in the rain. 
is the fact that they don't really race in the rain. What's the point of having rain tires, wet weather tires as NASCAR likes to call them, if you're not going to actually use them when it's wet? So they wait forever, they wait for the sun to come back out, and then they put the tires on the car, and then they send them out there, and they proceed to do so many laps of caution. And on here, it says that they only did four laps of caution. That does not seem correct at all. Um, they just kind of, it felt like forever, because I was listening to it in the car on the way home on Sirius XM NASCAR radio, and it felt like it was taking forever to get back going. It's like, you've got wet weather tires, you've got windshield wipers, you've got the flashlight, the blinking lights on the back of the car. Let's just get on with it here. Like, these guys are supposed to be professional race car drivers. That will continue to annoy me uh, for a while. But overall, a decent race. Not a ton to write home about. That was, like, super exciting. Ty Gibbs' burnout was a bit excessive. Doing a burnout's fine. Doing it when, like, the whole field still needs to come through certain corners and they can't see because there's just smoke everywhere. It's kind of a dickhead um, move, but it's Ty Gibbs, so it is what it is. Uh, overall, though, like, it was fine. It was an acceptable Xfinity race, but at the same time, you know, felt like it left a little bit to be desired, I guess. Uh, but, yeah, I don't know. I'd like to hear everybody else's thoughts. Let me know in the comments about that. Oh, speaking of their playoffs, though, for the Xfinity Series, obviously Ty Gibbs winning does not put another new winner in. You currently have Riley Herps, who is on the bubble right now because he technically doesn't have any stage win. Well, he has one stage win, but Sheldon Creed has more stage wins. Sheldon Creed, though, is 17 points to the good over Parker Kligerman. And then you have Riley Herps, who's 34 points to the good. So realistically, this is going to come down to Parker Kligerman trying to get in over either Sheldon Creed or Riley Herbst. You have uh, Brandon Jones still sitting 65 points out, and Brett Moffitt, Moffitt is sitting 95 points out. He's not going to make it in without winning a race. And they are headed to Watkins Glen this weekend as well. We'll see where they go, after, or not where they go, but how that pans out for them. And then they'll be back in action at Darlington on Southern 500 weekend. No, no, I'm dumb. Excuse me for a second. They're back in action at Daytona, obviously. Then they head to Darlington, Kansas, and, and then they're back in action at Bristol, which is the final race of the first round for the Cup Series. It's all very confusing if you're trying to line all the schedules up, but the Xfinity Series definitely does have a shot at, you know, having four pretty banger races coming up. Watkins Glen could be a little bit crazy. Uh, Daytona, obviously, is always crazy. Darlington's interesting, and then you have Kansas as well. And then Cup guys aren't allowed to be in the field anymore, which is certainly a plus. All right, moving on to the IndyCar race on Saturday. Again, got to the racetrack a little bit before 10 o'clock, I guess, or maybe at 10, whenever that lightning hold got lifted and uh, we could finally park and, and go into the track. Was walking around early on Saturday, stopped along the fence, and Ryan Priest just was right there watching practice with us. Very kind of bizarre. It is funny that you can walk past all these guys, and these guys can, a lot of them can walk around freely for the most part if they don't have their fire suits on. If they don't have their fire suits on, nobody knows who they are, uh, which is very bizarre. Like, saw Graham Rahal on Saturday morning, walked past him, was like, hey, good luck. And he just said thanks, and like nobody else seemed to even know that it was Graham Rahal. Kind of blew my mind. Um, same with Ryan Priest. Ran into some other people during the truck race on Friday night, which I'll get to in a minute. And yeah, whatever. The IndyCar race, though, was very typical of the IndyCar series at the IMS Road Course, uh, which is mediocre, I guess. Scott Dixon gets spun out on the first lap in an incident caused by his teammate Alex Pillow. Uh, which collected Marcus Armstrong, Joseph Newgarden, and Scott Dixon spun out. Dixon then takes the advantage of getting spun out and can go to an alternate fuel strategy, which is essentially uh, what this, they pit on basically on the same lap that they did last year and ended up winning the race as well. So Dixon goes from starting 15th to winning the race. Graham Rahal drove a perfect race, had 
one somewhat slow pit stop, gets behind Scott Dixon and couldn't get around him, chased him down there in the final five laps, but still couldn't get around him, gets his first podium of the year, though. Good news for RLL is they're finally somewhat back, right? Uh, they they won the race with Christian Lungard. They got the pole at the Indianapolis Road Course back in the spring. They get the pole again uh, in the late summer here with with uh, Graham. They have speed. They finished uh, second and fourth on Saturday, uh, as well as 14th with Jack Harvey. They're they're back ish. So you know maybe, but Dixon does potentially the most impressive thing in motorsports in a long time. His win on sun Saturday was his 19th consecutive season with an IndyCar win. Absolutely wild statistics. St yeah, statistic. Uh, considering IndyCar is as competitive as it is. It has the, it's the most competitive series in the world um, right now. And for him to keep winning is absolutely insane. So good for him. For the championship, though, Alex Pillow getting into... Um, Marcus Armstrong and then collecting Joseph Newgarden who was up on top of him and everything like that. Alex Pillow now has a 101 point lead over Scott Dixon who moves into second in the championship. Joseph Newgarden and his thirst traps move back to third. 105 points behind. Three races to play. Gateway, let's chalk that up as a Joseph Newgarden win. Alex Pillow just has to survive there. They then go to Portland, where Pillow can easily dominate. And then they head to Laguna, where Pillow absolutely eviscerated the field last year uh, in the finale. So I would not be shocked to see that all play out in his favor um, once again. So, yeah, Alex Pillow is sitting very nice. And we'll talk more Alex Pillow here in a few minutes. But... Moving on to the truck race on Friday night. So, went to the truck race on Friday night. Uh, Daniel Dye hooked us up with passes, like I said. Fun time. Went hung out with him for a while. Watched the end of the ARCA race uh, from the hillside there with he and Raja Carruth. And unfortunately, um, Luke Finhouse doesn't end up winning. That instead goes to Jesse Love. Uh, which, funny moment that happened there, but we won't say anything so josh wise though did call that finish rigged which was a bit interesting uh so then you know head to the infield after that you know with our our fancy passes here saw a bunch of bunch of people that were in there max pappas was there ty norris was there obviously svg justin marks ross chastain uh rolled in at one point you had ty dillon Corey lajoy colton herder were all there representing gainbridge and those guys saw Joey Gase at one point. There was just a lot of John Hunter Nemechek was there. A lot of industry people, a lot of media people. Basically, every media person that was there for the Cup weekend rolled over to IRP and was checking that out. Jordan Bianchi did not say hello uh, to him. Saw Toby Christie. He was deep in conversation, so I didn't want to butt into to his conversation uh, there. But it was fun to to be there. Uh, hung out with some Thor Sport guys that recognized me from TikTok, which is slightly terrifying. Got recognized multiple times this weekend from TikTok. I was not ready for that. Um, I appreciate everybody watching. It's awesome. If you do see me at a racetrack, come up and say hi because it's cool and I just want to talk racing basically all the time. Um, but it is still bizarre to get like recognized in public. A guy at the merch hauler when I was walking through at Indianapolis on Saturday was like, hey, you're the guy from TikTok. And I was like, that's Good that my face is so recognizable, even though I had sunglasses on and a hat. Um, I guess I was wearing a break card shirt, so that does make sense. Checks out now. Never mind. I'll shut up. But, um, yeah, watch the race from pit road. Ended up watching it from basically pit exit down in turn one, just because there's a really good sight line there. And pit road uh, behind the pit boxes at IRP is pretty narrow, especially up in the turn three and four section, which is where Daniel Dye was pitted at. And... Uh, just didn't want to be in people's way. Every time I've been on pit road, my whole goal is to just not be the guy that's in the way. Uh, so being down at the other end was a lot easier. Uh, but we were right next to Ty Majeski's pit box. Like I said, we watched it the last probably 50 laps or so with a couple of guys from the Thor Sport Body Shop, which was cool. And uh, obviously being next to his pit box when he won was really cool. Those guys uh, went crazy. Good for them. Ty Majeski in the playoffs. He just shows up, right? Absolutely dominated that race, like 179 of 200 laps or something like that. 
uh, was never really in doubt. Eckes was just, everybody was racing for second at that point. Haley Deegan did get turned by Landon Lewis, so shout out to the Thorsport boys that were in the body shop. Job security, as long as people keep wrecking her. And then, uh, yeah, SVG, of course, had his first pavement oval start. Finish, starts 28th, finishes 19th, likely probably could have had a top 15, but even he said that trying to tell the team what he wanted, he didn't exactly know what he wanted, so what he did tell them, and they kind of went backwards on what they should have done. So that's a bummer for him, but still good run altogether. Stayed stayed out, well, didn't get, not, I shouldn't even say stayed out of the way. Uh, past people, past multiple people, raced super clean, was running multiple different lanes, Said he had a hell of a time, so that's awesome. That's exactly what you want to hear coming out of that uh, race. So good for him. Great, great result for him to just finish all 200 laps is really what it comes. Actually, I think 199 because I think he was the first car lap down. But um, yeah, overall, really good experience for him. Tall guy too. When I was standing next to him, or standing in his vicinity, didn't want to bother him. And there was also a ton of of track house people around him. Um, but yeah, he's probably six foot or so, and I'm, I'm tall as well. So yeah, good for him. Um, nothing else really super exciting happened. Went to victory lane afterwards, got kicked out of victory lane after they figured out that we weren't with the team, but whatever, you know, you go to victory lane when you can, uh, which was cool. And then, yeah. Getting out of IRP, everybody's like, oh, send, send Xfinity your cup to IRP. IRP's going to need another exit. I had a pretty easy time breezing out just because of where I ended up parking at. Um, but I know some people said they had a nightmare getting out. I was just happy I didn't get stuck in like a a low spot where there might have been some water sitting from, when the, from the rain that they had. Because if that would have happened, uh, I would have been stuck for days. The black wing is not getting out of a mud hole at all, especially not on summer tires right now. So very thankful that I parked at least on a little bit of a rise and was able to get onto the road course portion at IRP to get out of there. But when people say, send, the, you could probably send the Xfinity series there. You could put 10 more thousand people in there and have a okay time. You're going to have to have some, they did. I will say this getting out of the lots. Cause if you've ever been to IRP, you know, there's only one main road that goes into the racetrack. You turn off of whatever that road is, I Crawfordsville Road or something like that, you turn off of that onto the property at IRP and you go past like the IRP building right at the front and you go down the long driveway back to where the drag strip is on the right and the ovals over on the left and they have these big fields that you can park in, which is great, plenty of parking. I mean, finding a spot's not an issue. They do a good job of getting people where they need to go there. The problem is when you go to leave, everybody just tries to get to that one road at the same time and exit. But once you get back onto the main road, the cops are running the lights for multiple miles until you get to the uh, highway. And it's just, they're just waving people through. Like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Big fan of that. Good traffic flow there. Always appreciate that. But having a cup race there, you can never do it unless you cap it at 20,000 or 30,000 people. Uh, because and if you did, if you wanted to go bigger and like turn it into you know, a, a 40 or 50,000 seat racetrack, you're going to have to figure out another exit on that at some point or widen that road or something. But, uh, yeah, overall super good experience. Shout out to Daniel for hooking that up and, um, yeah, we can go from there. Speaking of back to, all right, speaking of Alex Polo earlier, let's try to break down the Alex Polo story real quick. So obviously last year, Chip Ganassi Racing announced that they had picked up the option on Alex Pillow for 2023. Alex Pillow then put out a statement and a series of tweets saying that he had already informed Chip Ganassi Racing that he would not be racing with them in 2023. And then McLaren, right after that, put out a statement and a release on social that welcomed Alex to the McLaren Racing family. And then the legal system got involved, and then they finally agreed that Alex could continue his uh, development duties on the F1 side with McLaren, while racing for Chip Ganassi 
uh, racing in 2023. And then, you know, the thought was that he would move over to McLaren on the IndyCar side or the Formula One side, depending on whatever came open in 2024. So Alex Pillow has apparently never signed a contract that he doesn't immediately want to get out of. He wasn't happy with what he was being paid at Chip Ganassi Racing, which is why he wanted to leave to go to McLaren, where they're going to pay him a proper salary, um, one that behooved an IndyCar champion and a guy of his caliber. Obviously, that didn't happen. He stayed at Chip Ganassi Racing. And what has happened since then, he's been absolutely lights out this season and is on his way to his second IndyCar championship in three years. And there's now rumors that Chip Ganassi Racing has offered him a contract somewhere in that 3 to $4 million a year range to keep him with the team. Having said all of that, there's also talk, and McLaren seems to believe as well, that he has signed a deal with them for 2024 and beyond already, basically locking him into McLaren. Obviously, he can't do that if he already has a contract with Chip Ganassi Racing, and he has he can't sign a contract until after that September 1st date that comes up at the end of this month, which is why everybody's very confused about McLaren saying that he's already under contract for next year with them, because it can't be a binding deal because of what his Ganassi contract apparently says, unless it's somehow worked into his testing contract, which obviously we don't have access to that, so this is me just spitballing here. Which brings us up to this past weekend, where Zach Brown sent out an email to his IndyCar staff saying that Alex Polo was not going to honor his commitment to the team in 2024 and beyond and would not be joining the team. He's acting in bad faith and then Zach went on to whine about how they spent millions of dollars developing Alex Polo and how he's now turned his back on the team and they've already given him an advance on his 2024 salary and this and that. And Chip Ganassi, who notoriously never comments about driver contracts, weighed in for the first time in a long time that I can remember, saying that he has no respect for the current McLaren leadership team. He grew up respecting McLaren, and now he has no respect for their current leadership team. He and Zach Brown absolutely despise each other. He then said that it is ironic that they're playing victim, considering they started all of this mess last season. And McLaren always seems to be the ones, they're the common denominator, right? The Oscar Piastri situation uh, last year, this year with, or uh, this year and last year with Alex Polo. There's always weird things going on with McLaren. Personnel leaving, personnel coming, them trying to hire people away. Spawn, they're just, they're, they, they delve in that gray area. And Chip wasn't happy about it. And Chip finished off his statement by saying Alex Polo is under contract at Chip Ganassi Racing. So now... I think everybody assumes that he's going back to Ganassi in 2024, but then Marshall Pruitt also mentioned that he possibly was headed to Andretti at one point as well. Andretti and his financial backers certainly want to have drivers that that are there that are taking their seats on talent. They're willing to pay drivers to be in those cars. They don't need funded drivers coming along. So. Alex Bowes certainly fits that mold, and with Andretti constantly talking about wanting to join Formula 1, if that ever did happen, that opens up that Formula 1 door for Polo. So, where it stands now is maybe he's headed back to Ganassi for next year? It's very convoluted still. I guess we'll find out more maybe on September 1st, but the Alex Bowes saga rolls on once again. So... This upcoming weekend, though, we have the NASCAR Cup Series and Xfinity Series at Watkins Glen. IndyCar is off for the weekend, then we'll return uh, next, not this upcoming weekend, but next weekend at Gateway. Formula One is off as well, and they'll be back that same weekend at Zanvoort. Yes, so like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Breakhard, Instagram and Twitter at Breakhard Blog.